This program is made possible by the support of Delta Dental, Quick Trip, Marshfield Clinic Health System, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Hospital Association. Watch Wisconsin Eye on Spectrum Channels 995 and 363 and at wisi.org. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, we're glad to have you here. I would like to uh, personally thank the uh, meteorologists for changing their forecasts so that you all could be present today. Um, my name is Michael Jarr. I'm the vice president of the uh, Badger Institute. And the Badger Institute is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that uh, was established in 1987 to educate and energize Wisconsinites on key public policy issues critical to the state's future and prosperity. And that's exactly why we're here today, to, to talk about um, as we uh, deal with issues like poverty, what are the effective policy tools that we can use to, uh, to help to incentivize people into work and self-reliance. And we're very fortunate to have with us today um, Angela Rashidi. Dr. Angela Rashidi is a, uh, a leading expert on these issues and has done over the years a great deal of research and analysis um, related to poverty, to, to work, to safety net programs at the federal level, and so on. Um, and so let me very quickly just walk through uh, who our panelists are today, and I will uh, turn it over to Angela, who is a person you really want to hear from. Dr. Angela Rashidi is the Rowe Scholar in Poverty Studies at the American Enterprise Institute, where she studies poverty and the effects of federal safety net programs on low-income people across America. Her research focuses on the relationship between employment and poverty, specifically the effectiveness of government programs and policies on increasing employment and funding well-being and family well-being. Uh, before joining AEI, Dr. Rashidi spent almost a decade researching benefit programs for low-income populations in New York City, which has to be a pretty significant undertaking, I would expect. From 2007 to 2015, she served as a deputy commissioner in New York City's Department of Social Services, where she oversaw the agency's policy research and program evaluation efforts. She also evaluated the effectiveness of government programs as a senior researcher for Mathematica before returning to AEI. Dr. Rashidi is affiliated with the Institute for Research on Poverty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the Economic Self-Sufficiency Policy Research Institute, uh, I tried to remember that name, uh, at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, she is often published in academic publications and the popular press, including most recently uh, an article that she wrote um, uh, in the uh, recent issue in The Hill on the very topic that we're going to be discussing today. And uh, I was here. Uh, this is the report that Dr. Rashidi just uh, published uh, with the Badger Institute. It's called Wisconsin's Missing Rung. And it's a, 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 an opportunity for uh, Wisconsin to kind of look at, first of all, why is work important? What impact does it have on the ability of uh, people who are, uh, you know, facing uh, f financial challenges? What, how is it? Uh, enable them to achieve self-reliance. Um, she also took a look at the way that there's a flexibility within several uh, federal programs, including SNAP and TANF and the Earned Income Tax Credit, that allow for states like Wisconsin to create policies that incentivize people to uh, seek after work or training or, or whatever it may be that leads them on a pathway to work. Um, so Angela is going to come up and talk about uh, her studies, but first let me introduce our other panelists. Michael Lucky is a research assistant in the Wisconsin Assembly, working for uh, Representative Mike Rorcast from NINA. He has also worked for Representative John Murtha and Majority Leader Jim Steinecke. During his time uh, as an Assembly staffer, he helped develop a package of bills addressing homelessness. And following their passage, he was recommended by then Lieutenant Governor Rebecca Clayfish to direct the Wisconsin Interagency Council on Homelessness in its first year. In November 2018, the Council released a statewide plan to prevent and uh, end homelessness, uh, a plan that drew upon feedback from state agencies, federal partners, and communities throughout the state. Michael is a Milwaukee native, a graduate of Georgetown University, and serves as president of the, his Catholic Parishes Society of St. Vincent de Paul. 
And our final panelist is Aldira Aldape. Aldira serves as the Community Engagement Director at Americans for Prosperity Wisconsin. Her focus is to engage with Wisconsin communities on issues that prevent people from living their full potential. One of these issues is criminal justice reform, where Aldira hosts and participates in panel discussions and educational trainings throughout the community. She works mostly in the Milwaukee area to recruit, educate, and mobilize citizens on criminal justice reform. Aldira has been with AFP Wisconsin since 2018. Before that, she served as the Director of Bilingualism, Social Services at the Council, of the Spanish of, at the Council for Spanish Speaking. She holds a bachelor degree in business management from Cardinal Stritch University. Angela, it turns over to you. Great. Um, well, thank you everyone for uh, being here this afternoon. Thank you, Michael, um, for that introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you, um, talking not only about this report, but then joining um, the, my colleagues on the panel to talk about this important issue. Uh, some of you may be wondering after listening to my bio how I ended up here. Um, so I'm actually a Wisconsin native, born and raised in southwest Wisconsin in Lancaster in Grant County. Um, I went to college at the UW-Whitewater uh, UW uh, and then moved to New York City uh, in the early 2000s where I had the opportunity, as Michael mentioned, to uh, be the director or deputy commissioner for policy research and evaluation. Uh, during a pretty interesting time, I mean, it was shortly after welfare reform passed at, passed at the national level. and welfare reform was really being implemented um, uh, in stride in New York City. And in 2017, I moved back to, um, uh, we now live in Middleton, moved back to Middleton with my family and have been living there uh, since. And that has really given me the opportunity because I still work for the American Enterprise Institute, which is based in Washington, D.C., and focused on national policy, but it really gave me a chance to kind of reconnect with my roots um, and uh, through my affiliation with Badger Institute has allowed me to get involved in Wisconsin policy. Um, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, so today I'm, I'm just going to take about 10 minutes to, to kind of go over um, some of the key findings from the uh, Missing Rung report, as Michael mentioned, that I was able to write for the Badger Institute. Um, just a quick overview, I'm going to briefly touch on uh, just poverty rates in Wisconsin and at the national level, just to provide a little bit of context. And then I'm going to focus really re my remarks on kind of the motivation behind this report um, and uh, really thinking about, as a foundation, work as the path out of poverty. And then uh, also focusing, as Michael mentioned, about how how states, and in particular Wisconsin policymakers, can use federal safety net programs, three in particular, the Earned Income Tax Credit, uh, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, uh, and the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families Program, or TANF, how they can use, how states can use those programs to encourage work among state uh, low-income residents. So like I said, just to provide a little bit of context, um, and I'm actually going to skip over to the child poverty rates. Um, so Wisconsin has a uh, long history of having poverty rates, as you can see here, below the national average. Uh, and that is contributed to by a number of factors, demographics, uh, local economy, education level, things like that. Um, but it's pretty consistent, or it is consistent over time. So that this chart, the light blue on the bottom is Wisconsin's child poverty rate, and the, the darker blue on the top is the national poverty rate. So three kind of takeaways from this chart. One, Wisconsin and consistently is lower than the national child poverty rate. Two is you see this large decline in child poverty both at the national level and at the state level uh, over time. Um, and I will point out this is not the official poverty rate that you will see come out of the U.S. Census Bureau each year. This is actually a poverty rate that is produced by Columbia University. Uh, and the reason they produce this alternative poverty rate is because it better captures government benefits that go into uh, low-income households like the Earned Income Tax Credit, um, and it sets a threshold that uh, is absolute and changes over time based on inflation. So this is a measure that we're seeing more, more um, frequently than the official poverty measure because it better captures all of those things I mentioned. So, so um, with that, so we see these large declines in child poverty in Wisconsin as well as at the national level. And then one maybe cause for concern, and I kind of highlighted it here, is um, historically 
historically, there's been between a roughly six and kind of eight point gap in poverty between the national level and the Wisconsin uh, child poverty rate. And this has uh, narrowed in recent years, so this only reflects data through 2014 um, because we don't have more recent data than that, uh, but it potentially uh, raises some concerns that maybe Wisconsin is losing some ground to other areas of the country. And I think that's important context to think about how can Wisconsin continue on the path of keeping uh, poverty relatively low for children compared to the rest of the country. So in terms of this report, um, there were really two motivations for this report. One was just to lay the foundation or make the argument that work is the best path out of poverty. Um, I often, or I kind of get two responses when I, when I um, talk about work, work as a path out of poverty. One is that, well, yes, that seems rather obvious. Isn't that how uh, families get out of poverty? And the other is kind of naive, that people think I'm maybe a little bit naive to think that, oh, work alone can actually bring families out of poverty. But I always respond in that it's really important, I think, to really set that foundation, um, that work in, uh, is, the, is the path out of poverty, and then to think about that from a policy perspective of how do policies encourage work. Uh, and um, from a policy perspective then, uh, through this report, I was really making the argument that there's two sides to the equation. So if we believe um, fundamentally that work is the best path out of poverty, how do we achieve that from a, a policy perspective? On one side of the equation, uh, we need work uh, expectations, uh, meaning that benefit receipt needs to be conditioned on work. When people come and apply uh, for government benefits, there should be the expectation that employment is the path for uh, uh, their family. And then on the other side of the equation, it should be work supports and work rewards. So if, the, if families uh, go out and parents um, go out and find work, they should be rewarded for that work. And what can government do to reward that work? Uh, so this report then really looks at three federal policies and how states can kind of achieve those both sides of those equations uh, with the flexibility that the federal government affords them through these safety net policies. So like I said, I'm going to specifically talk about the EITC, SNAP, and TANF. Okay, so the Earned Income Tax Credit, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, but this is a federal program. This is a program uh, that is run through the tax system, and uh, it's a work reward system. Uh, it uh, is geared towards working families, and there's formulas that are based um, on how much a family works and the number of children they have, and it provides through the tax system a tax credit uh, every year that's uh, a lump sum payment to families that qualify. Um, one way that the federal EITC can be leveraged at the state level is through uh, state administration of state or local earned income tax credits. So Wisconsin is one of 29 states that offers an EITC at the state or local level, and it's one of 23 states that offers it as a refund. And when I say refund, it means uh, families who have no income, federal income tax liability, they get the EITC as a lump payment. Uh, lump sum payment. Um, so 23 states, including Wisconsin, also provide the state EITC um, as a payment, even if the family does not have any income tax liability. So as you can see here, it's not an insignificant number of tax filing uh, families in Wisconsin that get the state EITC. Uh, it's about, it's a little less than 240,000 um, in uh, the most recent year, 2017, uh, and in, in some recent years, uh, kind of during uh, more of the, the recovery years after the recession, it was as much as 270,000 uh, tax filing units. So that represents about 8% of all tax filers uh, in Wisconsin. Um, and so these are low-income households with children uh, who are eligible for the state EITC. You can also see here that on average, families in Wisconsin who are eligible for the state EITC get around $450. It's been pretty consistent over time. But that kind of masks some wide variation. So Wisconsin is actually the only state, at least that I could, um, uh, that I found, that varies.
varies the state EITC based on family size. So most states like New York, New Jersey, uh, Washington, D.C., their state or local EITC is based on a flat percentage of the federal EITC, no matter the family size. Wisconsin actually provides 4% of the federal EITC for families that have one child, 11% of the federal EITC for families with two children, and 30, 34%, I believe, for families with three children. So it's basically making the state EITC more generous the more children that you have. And I'll get to that, um, or I want to emphasize that point, and I'll get to that a little bit, uh, a little bit later. Um, but so you can see that uh, um, even though the average is about 450, that's uh, $450. Um, it could be much more for a family ha that has three, and that would be on top of the, the federal EITC, which um, can uh, be in the several thousand dollars, depending on the family and how much they work. So in terms of SNAP, um, so in the SNAP is a, also a federal program uh, that is state administered, but because it's a federal program, uh, there's very there's very little policy discretion at the state and local level in terms of setting eligibility for SNAP, uh, in terms of how the program operates. States are basically given the rules and regulations around how to operate the program, and states operate it. Um, and so the one exception to that is how they uh, implement work expectations. So the work aspects at the federal level, um, I would argue, are fairly weak in terms of there's not very many work expectations set. There's some work expectations set on childless households, um, and, but states even have the opportunity to waive that. But what the federal law does do is it gives states the opportunity to implement work um, expectations. And so Wisconsin in the past has done this. They have waived some of the requirements for child, or, or, way, or they have um, implemented requirements for childless households in SNAP, and in 2018, the legislature passed work expectations for parents of school-aged children. Uh, uh, regrettably, the current administration uh, uh, has kind of uh, pulled back on some of those policies. Uh, so uh, this administration vetoed uh, employment and training funding to avoid implementing the work expectations for parents of school-aged children, and they also have applied for and received waivers to some of the work requirements for childless uh, individuals. Um, so somewhat weakening those work expectation aspects of SNAP. And the reason this is important, and this is shown in this chart, is the blue bars there are the percent of SNAP households, and this is all SNAP households, but the percent that have no earned income. So these are basically about 60% of households coming in to apply for SNAP have no employment in their household. Um, and one could argue that state agencies that see these families have a responsibility to address the employment needs of this family, these families, because with SNAP alone and no employment, they certainly will be poor. And then finally, in, term, um, in terms of the last program, so the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, um, this is a program that has a great deal of state flexibility. So for those of you that aren't familiar with TANF, it's actually a block grant, which basically means that the federal government st sets some wide parameters around the program, but then they give a block grant to states, and states are allowed to set eligibility requirements and, um, again, with some uh, federal gui guidance, uh, set work expectations and, and work requirements. So in the report, I kind of touched on four policy uh, options that states have in terms of how strong they want to focus on work expectations or on how uh, weak they want to be on that. In terms of Wisconsin, um, and, and these programs are very complex, um, and Wisconsin is certainly no um, exception to that, but in terms of uh, Wisconsin programs, um, when you compare Wisconsin to other states in the country, Wisconsin is generally considered to be um, pretty strong on work expectations. Wisconsin has, for the most part, requirements that applicants um, must satisfy work requirements, so that's before they're even determined eligible, they must satisfy work requirements. It doesn't apply to everybody, but um, for many people it does. Um, they uh, follow the federal time limit, um, there's sanctions that could be, could graduate up to actually um, uh, reducing a benefit entirely, uh, and then uh, Wisconsin's also a little bit unique. In some ways, the benefit generosity is high, depending on what the situation of the case is, and in other cases, it's actually not very generous. Um, so it's kind of a mixed mixed bag there. But in general, I think Wisconsin is general, generally perceived as a 
state that implements some pretty strong work expectations for uh, TANF in, in Wisconsin, it's called Wisconsin Works. So just real quickly, I'll end with some of the recommendations then that are in the report. And again, this, the recommendations are all around this, um, the two sides of the equation, which I talked about. On one side, setting work expectations so that work is viewed as the foundation and the primary way, way to get out of poverty. And on the other hand, um, uh, devising government policies that really support work and can shore up low wages uh, when, when um, parents do need to go into the labor market and need to work for low wages. So with that in mind, some of the re recommendations in this report um, is an expansion to the, earned, the state earned income tax credit. Um, I recommend that the, uh, the rate for families with one and two children are at least made equal to uh, families with three children. Um, I would even go as far to argue that that the state EITC could be expanded uh, even more. I'm a big supporter of the earned income tax credit. I think that it is the right combination of supporting work and expecting work. Um, and we know from a great deal of research that increasing income through things like the earned income tax credit can have enormous benefits for children and young, young children in particular. And the earned income tax credit maintains that incentive to work while also providing additional resources into the household. So I think the earned income tax credit is a great policy tool for, for states to use um, for reducing poverty. I would also recommend consideration for an earned income tax credit for non-custodial parents. Um, so Wisconsin does not provide an EITC, state EITC, to uh, childless adults. Um, other, some other states do. Um, but one thing New York State does is provide an EITC only for non-custodial parents. And uh, research on that program there suggests that that benefits not only that non-custodial parent, but also the children of that parent who may live with the other parent. Um, and then to balance out those work supports and work rewards, I do recommend for a reinstatement of stronger work expectations in SNAP, meaning um, fully implementing the work requirement for parents of school-aged children, fully implementing the work requirements for ABODs, but really pairing that with employment uh, services and training, reinstating funding for employment and trading programs through SNAP, and also ensuring that those programs are effective. Um, I think it's um, not only in Wisconsin, but in another, a, a number of programs around the country, um, the employment supports and employment programs for people are not that effective. And I think that um, across the country, we can do a better job at that. And then finally, um, um, there's a few other things in the report about SNAP, um, ways to strengthen SNAP uh, requirements. In terms of TANF, uh, there was a law uh, passed to reduce the time limit in, in Wisconsin from 60 months, which is the federal time limit, to 48 months. It hasn't been implemented yet. I actually recommend that that is implemented, but again, it needs to be paired with effective services for families. Um, I don't think um, it serves families well to expect them to be on cash welfare for uh, uh, 60 months, five years. Um, that's certainly, that's going to guarantee they're in poverty for at least that amount of time. I think states like Wisconsin should be more, incentivized more to provide effective services that get them into the labor market and give them more opportunity for economic mobility. So I will end there, and then we are going to have a discussion. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Michael Lucky. I am a research assistant for Representative Mike Rorkast uh, from NINA. He sits on the Joint Committee on Finance um, and was, helped develop the assembly part of the budget for the Department of Workforce Development. And so there are a couple things I think I can speak on later if it comes up about some of the proposed changes to unemployment insurance that were in the budget that was something the legislature took a very hard look at. Um, but in my personal life, um, I do work a lot with low-income population. Um, I serve as president of our downtown Madison Society for St. Vincent de Paul. Uh, we do person-to-person -person service uh, for anyone that calls the churches asking for help. Um, I think most relevant to the discussion, though, was my former role as director of the Wisconsin Interagency Council on Homelessness. Um, and so I think uh, most of my remarks, at least in this opening part, are going to be uh, reflective a little more about the homeless population and, and um, some of the, the lessons I've learned and uh, some maybe the policy directions we can take there. So I'm a conservative. I work for conservatives. Um, and I do believe there's actually a conservative policy solution to homelessness um, that 
gives us a chance to prove that principles that the, the conservative movement embraces, something like work, uh, actually does lead to real-world solutions. It's the reason why, as a staffer, I took this on. It's the reason why, as I, I agreed to become the director of the council, and it's the reason why I'm here today. And I'm very excited, and anyone that knows me well knows that I talk about this issue all the time. Um, so the overarching point I'd like to make is this, though, is that everyone wants to find purpose. It's human nature to want to find your own individual success, your own individual fulfillment. And it doesn't matter if you're a millionaire or if you're middle class or if you were evicted for the first time or if you have been on the streets for 20 years. Government should always find a way to support human nature, not fight it. And we should never, ever assume that anyone is so far gone that they're either beneath our help or not deserving of our help at this exact moment in time. So I often say that homelessness is simultaneously the most visible and the most invisible symptom of poverty. And what I mean by that is that you have a very visible segment of homelessness. You're chronically homeless who are asleep on the streets, and nothing screams, I need help, like sleeping outside in a Wisconsin winter. But that is only 8% of the homeless population in the state. And if you go by the more expansive federal homeless definition, that's an even smaller number. The majority of homeless people are couch surfing. They're hidden. They are sleeping in their car, bouncing back and forth from hotel the room they can't afford to another hotel room they can't afford. So I'm bringing all this up to let you know that this population of homelessness is actually a lot more diverse than we might initially expect. And there's also a lot more tools for self-sufficiency there right away than we might initially believe. So uh, I, there was an interesting number that Dr. Rashidi had in her report. It was that uh, only a third of people who experienced poverty were actually employed that year they experienced poverty, right? That is almost identical to our homelessness numbers. 34% of people, so almost exactly a third, are employed the year that they experience home, or uh, at the time when they enter the homeless system. So you have two-thirds of people that are unemployed uh, when they enter the homeless system. Uh, and even as you're in this more nutrient-rich environment, your permanent supportive housing, with all these wraparound services and case management, you're still hovering around 60% employment numbers. So unless we as a state want to make our policy position to house 22,000 people a year, every single year until the end of time, there needs to be a step beyond housing towards individual success, individual stability, financial self-stability, and that really can only come through work. Um, so I'd like to read a quote that we actually had adopted in our state plan uh, in November of 18. Quote, the best way to prevent a slide back into homelessness once the temporary supports of subsidies and case management are no longer available is to prepare for a lifetime of independence through gainful employment. In addition to the need for financial self-sufficiency, the Interagency Council on Homelessness believes that work itself has value. People experience dignity, meaning, and community through work. So many of you have probably heard the term housing first. Housing first is a mindset. It's a mindset shift, but it's the belief that people are ready to be housed right away. It's not a specific program. Many programs incorporate the idea of housing first into it. Um, but what used to happen is people used to be in shelter, and then they would like learn the skills to become housed, and then they would go to a temporary housing or transitional housing, which is like 18 months of learning how to brush your teeth and make your bed, and then finally you're deemed ready to get an apartment, and then you'd get an apartment. But the problem was those people that would flunk out of the program, so to say, would just end up back on the streets again, and there would be no measurable difference in success between people that graduated from this uh, how, into this housing program between people that just got into housing right away. And so the idea is that, you know, it's a human need, it's a human nature again to want shelter, right? That's one of the most basic instincts we have. And so government should be supporting people's desire to be housed. And once people are housed, then you can start working on all these issues. We need to start thinking that exact same way about employment. There needs to be an employment first kind of mindset change when it comes to this population. People are ready for work and they're willing to work if they're given the chance to succeed and more importantly, the tools to succeed. There was a study done by the Baltimore Continuum of Care that showed that over two thirds of people experiencing street homelessness. So this is your unsheltered, your, your people in pretty dire straits. Um, but those people, um, two thirds express interest in looking for employment. There was a Heartland Institute paper that says that time and again, research shows that people in, uh, experiencing homelessness need to and want to work. Heads of households experiencing homelessness overwhelmingly opt into employment services when available. When given the right opportunities, tools, and supports, people experiencing homelessness can be successful in employment. But that same Heartland paper points out that there's really not much communication between the workforce system and our homeless system. And that's true in Wisconsin. It's, we hear it all the time from advocates, and it's part of the reason why we created excuse me, the council in the first place was to get rid of these silos, the silos between housing and corrections and health and workforce. Um, they have a, a, a heading in that paper called Few Carrots, Few Sticks, which I think is just such a, a wonderful way to say, like, there is no incentive, not carrots, not sticks, not anything that's really getting these systems to work together right now. 
Um, it might be because uh, staff might have preconceptions about uh, whether the people they're serving are, are able to, to work right away or if it would threaten their stability rather than support it. Um, you have staff and workforce development groups that might think have preconceptions of what a homeless person is, who they are, what they bring with them, the baggage and the complicated issues they have to solve. And, but realistically, again, people, people want to work. Um, there are three programs I'll just briefly bring up that I think support this, and I really would love if you guys could look into them a little bit more. But the first is called the Doe Fund. It's a project in New York City. I'm sure Dr. Rashid is very familiar with it. I, I heard about it from a book uh, from Arthur Brooks. He's the former president of AEI. Um, it's a homeless employment program. And uh, after, uh, after kind of graduating from this program, the success is incredible. Six months after graduation, six in, or seven in ten graduates uh, retain their full-time position. Uh, and those that had felonies coming in were 60% less likely to reoffend. Um, there's another shelter in Joplin, Missouri called uh, Watered Gardens. And they have what they call a worth shop. And it teaches residents to work for their room and board. Uh, an hour of work will earn you groceries for a week, uh, and 12 hours will get you a bed. Um, when I spoke with the people at Water Gardens, they told me that initially when they switched over to this type of system, they did lose a number of residents, but those that did stay had much greater success, not only in finding work, but also in remaining housed. And there's a program here in Waukesha, the Family Promise of Waukesha County, uh, that actually does a similar type of program. Uh, it's not necessarily employment, but it's something that you have to work. You have to work the system. Uh, and those that stick with it have a 96% housing retention rate. Um, I, I'm getting kind of the, the seven-minute uh, hand signal here from FLAD, so I'm going to wrap up now. I have some policy recommendations in the report. Maybe we'll touch on them later. But I just wanted to recap by saying, first of all, again, people want to be successful. Right? And we know through Housing First and things like that that we have a proven uh, model that shows that if we believe in someone's potential rather than their current situation, we actually have greater success in getting them to achieve the, the outcomes that government wants and that they want themselves. Housing is only one piece in, uh, in the homelessness puzzle. Um, it's a big piece. It's a big plateau near the summit of the mountain. But the, the top of and getting back to where you need to be has to be work. It has to be employment. It has to be independent financial stability because those subsidies run out eventually. And if people haven't learned the skills by themselves um, to maintain housing, it's all going to go away. So everyone has worth. It's human nature to want a purpose. And work not only gives people the ability to earn a wage, it also gives the ability to find dignity, meaning, and community. And that is so important. Good afternoon, Alira Aldape. August of 2000, uh, two, weeks be two weeks shy of my 18th birthday, I gave birth to my oldest son. Um, his name is Carlos. I had not yet graduated from high school. I was in 11th grade. I knew the work ethic was strong in my household. I've always seen it all around me. I had worked since I was 15. I dropped out of high school and I went to work. I had my son. Um, when I had my son in August, I, I was home with him for the six weeks. After that, I went to what is known as the YWCA in Milwaukee on Martin Luther King Drive. I didn't know what I was doing. My mom never showed me. Um, any sort of government assistance. Um, so I walked in, but I wanted to go back to high school. I went in and I was a, I met the requirements to be on the W-2 program. Um, that's a paid program in which you are eligible to either go to school or go to work for 40 hours. I went, but by the end of that year, I was 18 with a one-year-old son. Um, it wasn't enough about just going to school. I had to work. I couldn't be going around with um, it's a little over $600 that the state would give you. And it wasn't enough to cover expense needs and independentize myself from my parents' home. Um, and what I did was go back to work. At the age of 21, I did graduate with, from my high school, but I always worked full time. I never went back into government assistance. By the age of 24, I became a homeowner in the Bayview community. I had graduated by the age of 27. I graduated with my associates in paralegal because I had to take it as a part-time because I kept going on my full-time position job. By the age of 30, I was leading advocates out to Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. in 2008, 2010, and 2013 on immigration reform. By 2013, I graduated with my bachelor's from Cardinal Stritch. I did take my LSAT, but that's a whole other story after that. <laughs> with that being said, fast forward, 
um, in 2016, I learned about the Libre Initiative, an arm, Hispanic arm for Americans for Prosperity. I went back and forth and I debated myself if I should apply for a position that was um, offered to me. I did, because it talked about liberation. It talked about it being a freedom. It talked about me. It described me, and that's what gave me the opportunity to, to go through an interview, a three-panel interview in Arlington and, and sit there and talk about freedom and what freedom looks like for me. And I always advocated for individuals since 2004 when my high school principal hired me after I graduated from the alternative school. With that being said, now that I have the opportunity to be the community engagement director with Americans for Prosperity and talking to my leadership and seeing those around me in my neighborhood, I um, vouch to work with criminal justice reform. We work with organizations that are independent sized from government subsidy to meet the requirements and help those individuals that are re-entering society and transform their lives and stay away from subsidies and not return back to incarceration or fall back into a system, a cycling system. With that, I've had the opportunity to work with Pastor Jerome Smith, who we hold in prayer, who is ill today and is not able to participate with us. However, Pastor Jerome Smith founded what is known as the Joseph's Project. It's a project located on 55th and Center Street, which hosts a week boot camp for individuals to come in on time, as you do on, at work, take breaks as you do at work, not speak or speak as you do at work, and show individuals the principles of what work ethics are. If the individuals, these men or women, are either escaping a subsidy, home abuse, or just re-entering society and trying to fill, fill the potential, they can go through the program. And at the end of the program, employers, our own employers here in the state of Wisconsin, manufacturing jobs and more, are there and hiring at the spot. I seen it with my own eyes and I cried, I teared, because I couldn't believe individuals can meet a $18 hour a job. Let me repeat, it took me nine years to finish my, <laughs> my degree, so with, to be able to apply for a job at $19 an hour with the opportunity over time, it's amazing to me, and I, 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 Pastor Smith was here. I'm sure he'll invite you over to the Joseph's Project. Um, individuals are not returning back to their subsidies. Um, it, the low count of re, re, uh, recidivism. So again, if you would like to visit with Pastor Smith, and through Americans for Prosperity, I also have had the opportunity to work with God Touch Milwaukee. God Touch Milwaukee is located on 17th and Lincoln on the south side. It is a faith-based nonprofit. Pastor Marty Calderon founded the organization. Their men are able to live. It's a transitional home. Men are coming there with ankles on their bracelets or, again, escaping um, some sort of subsidy. They're able to sleep there, but there's a requirement. You have to go to work. And these men and women, I've sat there next to one individual. He said, hey, Marty, I got paid. It was a Saturday at 11 o'clock. He said, I got paid. He's like, can I go and get some shoes? He's like, look, they have holes in them. And they said, yes. And then they gave him the two-hour you know, window so he can go because they have probation officers, et cetera, watching them, um, their time. So Brother Marty and the staff there take a charge to see if, you know, what time they leave or come back. And so he went off to buy shoes. With that being said, I ask you to please visit both of these organizations these, both of these organizations have a very low count of recidivism. We need to stop the, the cycle that is happening here, especially in Wisconsin, most importantly in Milwaukee. Both of these pastors are from both the south side and the north side, um, working with all communities. There's no Hispanic, there's no black, there's all communities. So again, thank you for having us here. Thank you for being here, um, and thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you all. I, I think if uh, you've been paying attention at all, uh, we have a, a unique combination of uh, uh, intellectual heft and uh, passion on this panel. Uh, we really have people who um, know and understand these issues and in some cases have lived these issues and, and at the same time are driven by and motivi motivated by uh, making a change. Um, one, one, let me start with a, a, a question that, that to me is sometimes baffling. If work is an effective way to alleviate poverty, and if work 
gives people a sense of purpose, why does anybody oppose these work incentives? Um, it is a very good question, and it, and it may seem obvious. I mean, there, there is actually a lot of opposition to the work expectations that I described, and I think much of it comes from um, and, and they're not wrong, the, the reality of what work is. I mean, low-wage work, as I'm sure many people in the room know, is um, oftentimes not stable. Um, it can be in difficult environments. Um, and so I think the opposition often comes from the idea of if somebody's seeking help, uh, why should we be forcing them to do something that's so unpleasant? But I always, I mean, I, I do understand where people are coming from, but the pushback to that is, is what is the alternative? Um, that, that's not going to go away, and it's, it can serve as a stepping stone to other things. Um, and so I think that it doesn't have to be like these extreme side of the spectrum. We can have policies and community-based organizations and, and, and nonprofits and people in the community who are helping people deal with difficult situations that do exist in the labor market at the same time that we can still be firm and strong and say that work is the best path out of poverty. And I think a combination of those two things, so the expectations with those supports, is really the key. At the end of our report, um, we had uh, a section we called Further Considerations, and it dealt with some of the uh, issues that are tangentially related to work and success, but um, things like transportation, child care. Um, you know, uh, as Dr. Rashidi said, uh, if, you're, if you are in need of serious help, um, but you're not able to find a job that will pay you enough to actually get by, um, and you can't find a place to put your children uh, or you can't get a bus to and from work. I mean, there are many barriers to it, which I think um, you have to be all in on, on work supports. And I think that, you know, as, as future legislatures and, and administrations kind of debate the value of work, it, it does have to be something that's fully embraced from top to bottom. Um, and there really can't be many half measures. But, uh, you know, it, the answer is not taking away work, but it's also not just saying, you know, Good luck finding a job because if, uh, especially with the homeless population, if a lot of these people could have jobs, they would. <laughs> but there are many barriers to it. Uh, again, there needs to be a very holistic approach towards towards encouraging this, and there needs to be a, a full commitment. Um, speaking on unplanned parenting, uh, many of it, um, some of them may be opposed, is because of childcare. However, I always rethink to myself. Speak, you know. Let's, let's, let's reward the word innovation. We're in 2020. Many times there are employers, uh, there's positions where you don't have to be physically at a job. There's many ways you can care for your child from home. There's these beautiful devices called iPhones. There's devices named laptops. I mean, you have all types of apps in which you can share your knowledge. You can um, be on the field. You can um, snap your children into a car seat and be able to sell a product or a service on the field. I think um, it would be nice to consider those uh, type of initiatives nowadays um, with all the capabilities that we have. I think the cubicle setting is... Uh, a little backdated, to be honest, depending on the workforce that the individual is or in the industry. And I also consider we have an opportunity here um, of entrepreneurship. Uh, we keep with our friends out at Wibic, our friends out at BizStars, our friends out at Generator. I mean, there's so many other opportunities in which we can continue to promote um, self-entrepreneurship and uh, see how individuals can have other means of income while there's, uh, there's another subsidy, another parent that is probably doing the the 40-hour week uh, uh, workforce. So um, those are my recommendations in regards to um, the child care need because many individuals do choose to stay home and um, live within their means of what the government. And, but again, that person is probably not being able to self-fulfill their person. And then we have what we see today, which is a lot of uh, depression. So, um, okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. And Angela, let me just clarify, too. Your research in this study focused primarily on able-bodied people who are without children. Is that, is that right? Well, I did focus on people with children as well. Okay. Um, but I didn't touch on child care assistance in this report. Yeah. Um, it, 
this report does cover people who are able to work. So we do have another kind of set of challenges with people who are, um, have debilitating health issues or health issues that prevent them from work. And so the programs I talked about are, are, don't address those issues and work isn't always the best strategy um, for them. But to the childcare point, I mean, I think you're exactly right. Childcare always comes up, that and transportation as kind of the primary barriers to work. It's interesting though, there's obviously a disconnect between what the government offers and what um, the community knows. So Wisconsin is in kind of a unique position. They actually have more child care subsidy money than they can spend. Most states have a, have a shortage of child care money and there's people on waiting lists. Wisconsin's not in that situation. So clearly there are some, some challenges there. It's either a lack of providers that offer subsidies or it's access in the community. Um, but I think that that's one area that certainly can be looked at um, because it's true that, that those barriers to employment really set people back. Um, there's a, uh, the Trump administration has been promoting uh, work incentives as, as part of uh, a Medicaid. Um, and there was a decision uh, just last week uh, at the, uh, um, what was it, the circuit court, the appeals court level uh, in Arkansas, in an Arkansas case. And the, the court basically ruled that, um, they basically ruled against the administration, and I want to make sure I get this correctly. They, they said that the administration failed to show how uh, work requirement rules help Medicaid meet its mission of uh, caring for the poor. I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Um, does, first of all, does this have any bearing on uh, any of the programs that we're talking about? And uh, what are, what's your assessment of this decision? Um, so... When we look at our Medicaid population in Wisconsin, it is consistently declining, except for two areas. One is the elderly blind disabled, EBD, and the other is able-bodied adults without dependent. That is primarily single males, primarily middle-aged, um, that overwhelmingly disproportionately use the Medicaid system. Um, so yes, <laughs> there is a direct correlation between the people that, that work programs are specifically targeted for and easiest to apply with and the population that is costing the state a disproportionate share of Medicaid. Um, coincidentally, or maybe not, that also happens to be the uh, largest uh, cost driver in homelessness is single adult men, usually in their 40s, usually with a substance abuse disorder. Um, I quickly wanted to point out, though, in the audience, I see Representative Rodriguez. Um, she actually authored two bills on homelessness, both related to work. One last session uh, creating a uh, model after a Better Way initiative in Albuquerque, and then one this session uh, that was taken from the plan we wrote that would help uh, incentivize the state workforce boards to uh, work with the homeless populations better. So uh, she's fantastic, and I'm glad to see her here. Um, just, yeah, just a real quick on Medicaid. I mean, I think that all of the concepts that I discussed apply to Medicaid as well. I think there should be work expectations. I think that agencies that are administering Medicaid should talk to families and applicants about a lack of employment in the household. I think though the problem with what we're seeing happen, and I mean I'm not a lawyer, but I would tend to agree with that decision, is that Arkansas implemented their requirements really poorly. Um, it was very clear that they had dropped a number of people from their Medicaid roles who were not going to, to work. And I think that that really did a disservice to a lot of other states, including Wisconsin, who may want to implement work requirements for Medicaid because it was implemented so poorly. But I do think that states, if they could figure out a way to implement them properly and really assess people for employment and then um, connect them to uh, effective services and then connect them to employment, I think a very clear case can be made that employment um, very much benefits health. Um, and so that, that link is there, um, but I think it's the implementation that just completely fell apart. I'd like to uh, uh, take some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, anybody have a question for our panelists? Who wants to start with that one? So the, the question was if we could blow up the entire welfare system, kind of how would we redesign it, um, basically? And well, so um, 
I would not support a UBI, <laughs> a universal basic income. So there's a lot of push out there right now for kind of a universal basic income, which you're basically just giving families um, cash, more or less, um, and, and getting rid of all the supports that we have. I wouldn't necessarily go that far, but I definitely would support um, a more coordinated system that doesn't have all of the silos that we currently have. I mean, there's just there's so many silos. Just the three programs I talked about, they don't... They're not coordinated. There's there's um, different uh, schedules for eligibility that creates these cliffs, so you might lose more money than you earn in the labor market, and so it just creates all these weird incentives for families. So I think a system that was much more coordinated and really recognized that work was the is the foundation, is the starting place, and then can give families flexibility to figure out what more assistance they need to make uh, work uh, work for them. So child care, transportation, whatever, whatever, that, whatever that is, give them some flexibility. And that's why I've written in the past about having a system that is um, very much focused on the earned income tax credit. So maybe it's a system that kind of gets rid of everything else we have and just gives a very large earned income tax credit. I could see a system like that, um, which is similar to U UBI, but is still connected to employment. I completely agree. <laughs> I'm j I was just trying to look up quickly, and I don't think I'm going to be able to get it in time, but uh, the amount of money that we spend just to administrate uh, or administer our Medicaid system um, with third-party contracts and things like that is like an eye. It, it is... It, Massive. It is huge. It's it, it's insane, and the fact that we do that for just one program in a social safety net that again has different eligibility schedules than any of the workforce programs or any of the stuff that's administered through DCF, um, that that would be number one. I think is again not looking at necessarily a universal basic income, but some way to to have a holistic view of someone that's interacting with, with government assistance because um, the people that know best those eligibility requirements are the people that are on them and know exactly how much money they need to make and can't make in a month. Um, and it just artificially holds people back in these systems where uh, to get ahead you have to go way down for a little bit and, and that is just not an option for many people. On a community standpoint, if um, I'll speak on behalf of Milwaukee, which is my community. I would go back into the high schools and offer the trade and tech and business degrees um, opportunities and learning instruction so that when an individual um, completes a K through 12 education, he or she does not have to be required to go to a secondary or higher education and get in some sort of debt. So they fear from that and then they go into a job that may pay them at a minimum wage. So I would go back into the community high schools and assure someone that, had, that that person, that graduate, that high school graduate is well prepared, either in automotive or um, Juno Business School used to be, South Division Business School, Riverside used to uh, prepare you with university credits. All these schools had trades in which some, everyone who was graduating, and we know a lot of them here today who are 18, were 18 and they started their apprentice and are journeymen, and today and they, they're still making over $34, $36, an hour. Um, I, I, I still sit with these individuals. I, I think that was a great opportunity for everyone so that they don't have to start their families at a young age and depend on a government system. Um, so with that being said, that would be one of the things that I would go back into communities is assuring someone if you went through to, to school from K-4 to 12th grade, I hope you're able to, with you're physically able to contribute back to society without um, any higher education depth um, and not have to go into government subsidy. Any other questions? Yes, definitely. I very much support, and actually that's the direction we have to move in, especially if, I mean, the EITC has grown substantially since, I mean, it started in uh, the 70s, but really in 93, even since 93 it's grown. I mean, we're talking about several thousand dollars that families get in a lump sum. And so the idea that that's going to really shore up low wages is kind of missed when it's <laughs> provided once a year. So the problem with that, though, is there was a program for an advanced EITC um, that was not implemented well. There were a lot of problems connecting it to employers and all that. It, kind of, it went away, and actually the Obama administration had, um, eventually just wrote it right out of the 
federal law. Um, and, and so that kind of set the stage, and so now people think, oh, it's not possible, but I think that there needs to be um, more work towards it. And there's individuals that are doing research right now. Steve Holt, um, who's done work in Wisconsin, but he lives in Chicago, um, they did an experiment where they provided an advanced EITC to some families, and some of the concern around it is that families might um, owe some back at the end of the year because it's hard to predict um, how much exactly you're going to get because it's based on your earnings. Um, so what they actually did was they advanced half of it to some families and then advanced like three quarters to other families and, and tried to figure out um, if that worked and it worked pretty well. The other concern is that families have used the EITC currently as a forced savings program um, and have used it for large purchases because it comes one time a year. So some people are concerned, oh, well, if we do that, it'll take away that benefit to families. And I don't know how much I really agree with that. I think they do that because that's what the program is. I think if it came to them more regularly, they would use it for ongoing expenses. That is a, so the question is about, did I consider subsidized employment um, as part of my recommendation? I did not, um, and I have to admit, part of my view on subsidized employment is biased by my experience in New York City. It, my experience in New York City. So we had um, actually one of the largest subsidized jobs programs for TANF recipients in New York City, and uh, I evaluated it. Um, we found that participants in subsidized jobs were no more likely to get an unsubsidized job than people who did not um, go into those subsidized jobs. So it basically was like a placeholder using public dollars for people who could have gotten a job in the, in the private market on their own. And it actually, we found through qualitative work that it actually kind of harmed people in the end because the subsidized jobs were kind of protected jobs. Like if people didn't show up to work, they would get a lot more chances than if it it was a regular employer. So they got a little bit, um, they, were, they were so protected that then what they looked for in an unsubsidized job after the subsidized job didn't meet their expectations and they kind of fell back a little bit. So I think that subsidized jobs can be useful. I just don't think the evidence is very strong that they actually lead to, um, that they lead to positive outcomes, with the exception of certain populations. They have been shown to be pretty effective for people who are reentering um, from the criminal justice system. Um, and effective in the sense that it reduces recidivism. But I think if we, if we want subsidized jobs to lead to better employment outcomes, I just don't think the evidence is there. I think we have time for one more question. Um, the question was, what's the status of the broad-based categorical eligibility rule? So the Trump administration proposed um, rolling back a rule that allows states to basically expand the income uh, criteria for SNAP. Um, and it was kind of like states were able to exploit TANF a little bit to expand income up to 200% of poverty, and a family would still be eligible for SNAP. So the Trump administration proposed rolling that back and not allowing states to do that and kind of returning the income eligibility criteria to what is in the law, which is 130% of poverty. Um, so the comment period for that was opened. Um, I believe it's closed again now. They opened it twice. Um, I believe that that rule is going to go into effect probably in the, in the near term. Yeah, I do. That's, it's something the administration can do administratively, um, and I think they'll do it. 
Well, please uh, join me in thanking our distinguished panelists for their time. Perfect. Perfect. This program is a production of Wisconsin Eye, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit media network with a mission to inform, educate, and engage the citizens of Wisconsin. Wisconsin Eye is the nation's first and only independently funded state civic broadcast network, providing gavel-to-gavel -gavel access to government proceedings and events at the state capitol. 